Is there a strategy that'll help you grow your company faster? CEO Sales Strategies is an investigative business podcast for entrepreneurial people who never stop asking questions. Highly acclaimed sales revenue growth expert, Doug C. Brown, interviews CEOs, business owners, and professionals who serve them to uncover and share actionable tips and methods behind their bulletproof sales strategies. Topics covered on the show include their failures, struggles, secrets, and processes that help them succeed in selling millions to billions of dollars of their products and services, all with the sole aim of helping you grow your business. If you are eager to know the most effective sales secrets from the A players of the game, then the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast is certainly the place to be. Hey everyone, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. Anthony P. Garcia is here today from Catapulting Commissions. We are going to talk about two really important topics. The first is how do we know when it's time as the founder or the owner of a company to stop being involved in the sales process, whether it's you stop too late or you stop too early? We're going to discuss this. Uh, and how do you transition from a founder or owner and transition the power of selling to a team in that process? That's the first thing we're going to talk about. And the second thing we're going to talk about is how do you master the discovery process to speed up the sales process? Because, you know, here we are, you know, post pandemic sales has changed. And those of you who are still fighting that idea, I can tell you, uh, you know, it's always going to be human to human connection, but the process is actually changed. And if you're following a process that you were doing five years ago and it's not working like it is supposed to, it's because the model shifted. And your model must shift with that particular model. So without further ado, let's go talk to Mr. Anthony P. Garcia. Anthony, welcome to the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. And thanks so much for being here. Doug, thanks for having me. Excited to spend some time here. So we're going to talk about when it's time or how do you know when it's time for the founder of a company to actually stop being involved in the sales process itself. And I found this a fascinating topic, Anthony, because, you know, of our backgrounds and uh, between yourself and myself, a lot of times the founder is involved in the sales process and, and they're kind of screwing it up. So wh why should a founder not be involved in the sales process at, at times? Yeah, good question. Great place to start. So let me start by saying this. The, the founder involved in the sales process, as we grow in scale, right, and we're, you go from a startup to, to full-fledged eight, nine-figure organization, right? when, when you're in that startup phase, the founder is heavily involved, right? I mean, you, you, whether you have some funding, whether you're, 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 you're grassroots and bootstrapped yourself up to your business, the founder has a lot of skin in the game. So founders in the entry-level, early stages of business development, I see founders sometimes remove themselves too quick from the sales process, right? They're, they outsource the sales process or they, you know, they hire a sales manager or VP of sales, someone who has experience and kind of give that person the reins and then step away. And the inverse, there's sometimes when the CEO has things to do, such as run the organization, new product development, larger, uh, larger business development, and they're not you know, they try to get involved in that sales process. So it's like that fine balancing act. So long story, here's where, here's how I look at when a CEO knows it's time to eliminate the sales, to eliminate themselves from the sales process. Super simple. The moment you become the bottleneck, the instant moment that you become the bottleneck is time to eliminate and remove yourself from the sales process. Now, when we eliminate and remove yourself from the sales process, there's two ways to go about it. The right way, the wrong way, wrong way. I'll have founders that will have built their organization from the ground up, have monthly recurring revenue, have built some profit and hit a certain revenue metric. They're like, hey, Anthony, I'm the bottleneck and I removed myself and I turned over the reins to either an outsourced sales team or to my SDR or VP of sales, whoever it may be. My first question is, how much time has that person spent shadowing you, training with you, watching you. And if the answer isn't forever, then the answer is wrong. So to scale out, I tell founders, you're, think about 
We pick any sports, Major League Baseball, farm team system, starting quarterback, backup quarterback. The person that's going to run your sales department should be shadowing you for quite a long time because there's a lot of industry insights that the founder has on the way they do business in their organization that someone has to shadow, has to learn, and you can't substitute on the job training. So my, my short answer is the moment you become the bottleneck, that's the time for you to really look and say, am I a value add or am I a distraction add? It's a really great point. I mean, if we look at professional sports, as you were, were referring to, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo was shadowing, you know, Tom Brady, right? So, yeah. and, you know, in hockey, they'll send, they'll send veteran players down to the AHL versus the NHL just to teach the upcoming kids, I'll call them that, you know, they're 19 years old at that point, you know, how to actually be a professional level player uh, so that they, when they come up to the NHL, they don't get, you know, clocked against the boards or whatever um, and that they're an asset. But a lot of times I find, and that's why I was saying in the beginning, sometimes they're screwing it up. I agree with you because what ends up happening is sometimes they're handing it off too quickly. And that person, it's like, it's kind of like, hey, jump into a professional boxing ring when you were, you know, a, a Golden Gloves champion. You might be able to handle yourself in that ring, but there are some finer nuances playing on the higher levels, especially on that founder CEO level, that when we're talking from CEO to CEO, if we don't understand the language of the other CEO or what the commonality amongst that CEO speak would be, we, we break rapport sometimes in the sale and we, we just mess it up. And it's not the salesperson's fault at that point. It's just that they haven't been trained appropriately to be able to understand how to think and function at that level. That's what I'm hearing you say. Is that accurate? It's 100% accurate. And when that disconnect happens where, where your salesperson can't think and function at that level, yeah, I'm sure you've heard this, Doug. You'll hear CEOs have a bad sales team. Salesperson isn't getting it done. I mean, it's an instant blame game. This person's not doing it. This person's not doing it. Lead gen's giving me the wrong leads. And then your salesperson feeds into it. Um, and I've had some difficult conversations with some really successful CEOs of organizations. And I say, look, you're not going to like what I'm about to tell you, but you don't hire me to be your friend. This is actually your fault. Like, I, I want to be crystal clear. The fact that you haven't allowed this person to shadow you and learn everything and truly be your understudy, th that's a challenge. So I always tell you, if you know you're getting to that point where you want to remove yourself from the sales process. Either you're starting to bottleneck um, or, or you, the, the company is growing at such an accelerated rate. The very first thing that you need to look at is say, who is my understudy and how much time are they spending with me? And the answer should be a damn lot. Yeah, and I, and I, I would do it on the reverse. I agree with you. I would do it on the reverse with the sales team and say, look, you must know how to think like a business owner or a CEO if you're selling to a business owner or a CEO. So it's incumbent upon the sales team as well to understand how to actually think and function at that level. Because you and I both know, because we've sold to these levels, you walk in and a business owner has a problem and we're trying to present it from a sales position, then the business owner's feeling, look, you're trying to sell me something, I get it. And that's what I'm in business to do too, but you're not hearing my problem on my level and therefore rapport is broken and, you know, all, all other things made equal, uh, business owners and CEOs want to do business with people who play win-win on their own level. That's, that's yeah. what I have found. Yeah. I, I actually love how you explain that, that, that really hits home to me and I've never I've never put it in that perspective so I may steal this and, and, and drop it on my clients who haven't listened to this portion because what you just shared with me I always tell clients the greater you understand the person's problem and you can articulate that you have a clarity and understanding of their problem the less you actually have to sell because if you can understand the problem for the most part someone's going to make the assumption well then if you understand my problem so well you must have a solution right. and when it goes founder to founder CEO to CEO yeah, there's, you know, we resonate with problems. So we definitely understand where you've been. So I've never, you know, I've, I haven't thought of it that way, but that makes tons of sense. That's a great point, Doug. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I often, and Anthony, I, I love what you said in the beginning here, you know, they aren't set up to actually outsource to a team, right? But a lot of founders 
especially if they had previous businesses and they've been successful before. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll just hire people in and they'll just go do their thing. And, you know, and then when it doesn't work out, of course, as you said, they're going to blame the sales team, right? And so when I look at their lead flow, for example, that's coming through the, the company, let's say they're supplying leads to their sales team. I often find that they're providing them leads or marketing qualified leads, but not sales qualified leads. And so there's that whole, uh, I would say, holistic process, right, of, dri of driving a lead to getting it to the conversion side. And when the company is not necessarily set up to handle a sales team and they're dropping leads in that aren't going to convert, I'll go back to what you just said, the hard conversation that you have to have with the owner. It is the owners or that person who's outsourcing that. That's their fault at that point. It's not the sales team's fault. And it's so difficult, I have found, for founders or others who have, you know, hey, I've been selling and it's been successful for me. So why isn't it successful for them type thought process? It's so difficult, I have found, for them to kind of grasp that concept. And once they grasp it, to even accept it. And... Have you found the same would be the first question. And, and then, you know, why do you think that happens if it is? So I believe the second go around, right? So we'll talk like repeat founders or people who've run successful businesses. It's like, example, if I don't know any better and I go to the gym and I want to get in shape and I hire a personal trainer and I eat healthy and I do the right thing. But I don't know any better. So I'm not going to question. I'm just going to do everything that the trainer tells me, all the research I've done. So I'm going to eat healthy. I'm going to get up every day. I'm going to go work out. I'm not going to question anything. And I'm going to get amazing results. And then I want to stop. And I'm going to come back a couple of years later, be like, oh, I can do this. You have the know-how or the experience of the level of success. But sometimes we forget some of that work that took place to get there. Some of the basic fundamentals. And we have to take a step back and start over. So yeah, I have found it. And here's who I found it with, Doug. Full transparency, I found it with myself. Because I know the very first business I ran, I was 22 years old. 22 years old, and I did like 10, 12, 16 hours a day in my first year building this business, getting up. Never complained, never questions asked. It was just got up, did this, addressed issues, raised a team, trained sales, helped customers, did the whole nine, never stopped. Closed the business down, had some challenges, went to corporate growth, came back, relaunched the second business. It's going to be almost five years, four and a half years now. And I remember coming to my wife when I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, I, I overestimated how easy this would have been because I did it back then. But it was really a, actually, I didn't anticipate to do the fundamentals again. I didn't think I had to. I thought my, my skill set was better. I was a little bit more mature. I had more business insight. I've done it before. And so to go back to the fundamentals and do the basics, right, the blocking and tackling the X's and O's of business development and growing a business, sometimes we skip out on that because we've had a level of success before. And when that happens, that's where I am a big advocate to have somebody in your corner to tell you, hey, you're doing this wrong. And you know, a recent, recent client I, I, I had, I just retained, uh, I asked, you know, I always ask clients, so, you know, what, what is it about me or why are we making this decision to move forward? And the answer was enlightening. Everybody around them in their community, bankers, CPA, the mayor of their town, you guys are doing phenomenal. You're great. You're bringing jobs to the community. We love having you here. No one tells them, Hey, this is what you're doing wrong. This is where things are making mistakes. Um, so you have to have that person in your corner. And for me, myself, I have that person in my corner that was like, whoa, wait a minute. Just because you did it, you know, 14, 15, 16 years ago, doesn't mean you can just pick up where you left off. You have to start all over. I love what you just said. <laughs> um, we're speaking with Mr. Anthony Garcia. The company's called Catapulting Com uh, Commissions. Correct. You can find Anthony at Anthony P for perfect, uh, Garcia.com. And uh, I love what you just said, because so many people who have had past successes think that because they've had past successes, that what they're going to do is going to turn into magic and gold uh, day one. And I have found this even more, uh, the challenge even more exacerbated over the last, say, two to three years where the shift in the pandemics happened in sales, 
where, you know, I mean, I'm an old guy. So back in 19, I don't know, 98, 97, six, somewhere around there, you know, when DSL was coming in from dial up service, I'm like, uh-huh. this is going to change how sales is done forever. And people were like, you're crazy. That will never happen. Right. I'm like, no, no, no. Things will go more virtual. You can get all this information online and, you know, now today we're the sales team that, you know, they rely on us for the expertise, but think about it. They can go out over time and find things that we've been telling them. They won't need us as much. They'll need us as a sales team, but just differently. And so I find now, hey, 2022, 2023, we're here. And I'm finding now that a lot of people are having a really hard time embracing the new way of selling and that marketing now is far more important to be in the sales process, but from a salesperson's perspective, even more so that they have to become almost like micro marketers and putting themselves out there in the public square more because people are, I mean, with a click of a few button strokes, you know, you you can find anything you want pretty much. Right. And so by the time that they're inviting salespeople in, it's like, they've already kind of made a certain decision about what they're looking for. Now they're just looking for the right people or right entity to help them. And I think a lot of people, at least people I'm talking with, Anthony, who are selling or CEOs of companies are not doing the fundamentals of the selling process. And or they're so stuck in a rigid system that worked seven years ago. And it's not what they want now. And they're trying to go back and do this long discovery process through the process or whatever. And they're losing sales because of this. Um, Have you found a similar thing that's happening as as well? Yeah, absolutely. So two things, right? I I definitely think when we move into the discovery process of working with the prospects, I I see many people doing it incorrectly. But before I get there, one thing that you mentioned, right, the, the ability for our consumers to find really anything about us before they meet with us you know it's it's at this point if i'm selling whatever it is i need to make the assumption that this person's done their homework on me my company my competition probably even my pricing right if you're sufficient big enough have enough reputation your information's out there so make all those assumptions you you mentioned that uh you know dsl to transition or you know transitioning from you know dial up to dsl and you know you go dsl to web and and then you know web to to video and text messaging and now automations and the 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 constant evolution is changing and we as ceos as as really we're sales professionals as a ceo we have to evolve with it there's a study done out of oxford university and i'm going to butcher the name of it but here's the more the idea behind the study was the future of automation, right? What jobs will be most likely to be automated in the future and can be transitioned and we don't need anymore, right? The likelihood that a salesperson is going to be automated or, or not no longer a necessity is up to 88, 90%. That's, that's scary. A sales manager, a sales director, a CEO is less than 10% because that ability to influence and forecast It's something that we can't do it. So the human uh, approach of influence is something that cannot be automated. So, you know, mention that there for for the CEOs that are listening, right? Your role has to adapt and move in in order for us to grow. And with the adaption and movement of growing, it really is this discovery process. Many years ago, we had these long, drawn-out discovery processes. We build some rapport. We would qualify our, our prospect. You know, we we ask some questions, right? And, and the the whole premise of question based and question based selling. And we were we were doing this long conversation, but the questions we were asking were really in alignment to help set up us for a pitch. So if, if I'm setting myself up for a pitch, whether it's a one call meeting or to book the next meeting, if I'm in a long enterprise sale. These long processes are no longer being welcomed and received by our prospects. Our prospects want a much shorter, faster process, significantly faster. And as we <clears throat> as we evolve, we as owners and CEOs and salespeople have to adapt to what the market wants. And that is a faster, quicker sales process that's more efficient. Um, and it's not just giving somebody the price. That is well said, sir. <laughs> it's... Uh... It's it's well said because it's it's so accurate on what's happening now. And 
when we're looking at the discovery process, I think you brought up this earlier, like they, they're they already going to know. They've already looked at you. They've already uh, know more about you than you might know about ourselves <laughs> in some capacity, right? So, and I'll, I'll illustrate this way. I was looking at a new vehicle the other day and um, a couple of weeks ago. And when I went to the the dealership, you know, I was talking to the the dealer and I was like, well, you know, how long have you been in business? And the sales rep's like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, uh, well, you started in 1967. Um, and, you know, and, I'm, and I'm going on with these things and I'm asking him questions like, well, in this model car, you know, can you get heated back seats? And he goes, well, I don't know. I said, well, you know, in the, this XLS model, it says heated back seat. You know what I mean? Like I'm asking him questions. He doesn't have the answer. So my trust meter is dropping precipitously at that point. And if we're not a master of understanding everything that's going on, and in his case, he, he might not have been able to do a lot of research on me because it was kind of an incoming, but I was an online inquiry first. So to your point, we as the sales team also should be doing extreme research as much as possible on the people that we're going to see to shorten up that discovery process. So I would like to know your steps, if you would, like how do you master the discovery process to speed that sales process up? I teach people research is key number one. You must go and do research. And it's one of the most reluctant uh, pro things that you know people are most reluctant to, but it's so critical um, to do it in, in my estimation. So, but I'd like to turn it over to you. You're the expert on this. How, how do you master the discovery process to speed that sales process up? So a couple things there. First things first, uh, you, you said you like to do research in the beginning. And I, I love that you said that, right? Um, the whole premise of spin selling, right, is one of the, the S in spin selling is situational based questions. So I look at the people I work with. And I say, okay, we're going to do a discovery call. But we're not going to, you know, we're not, we're not going to spin sell. Because with all honesty, I'm not going to ask situation based questions because I should know the answer already, hence doing research. So I, I love that you say that because to me, I want to grab as much information as possible. So you and I are in alignment there. I think grabbing the situation, understanding the situation is important. So much so that I tell the people that I work with, if the information is available online, you shouldn't have to ask it. You, you should not have to ask it. And if you're bringing it up, it's only to link together familiarity, link together a problem, or to demonstrate that you've done your research on this situation. So that, that, is, that is first one. The, the second thing that I tell everybody in the discovery process is we have to take time to understand why in the world is this person meeting with me? Like, like let's, let's be clear. I would love to think that I'm the best in the world at what I do. I'm sure, Doug, you like to think you're the best in the way you do. We have to be realistic and say, okay, yeah, I'm pretty good. Doug's pretty good. There's competitors that are pretty good. So I just want to know, why are you talking with me? So a long story short, in grasping the situation, now I want to grasp the internal motivation for this person meeting with me. Because at this point in a discovery call, they're giving me their most valuable resource, their time. I have found that majority of the time we do a discovery process with somebody, they've researched us online, they've watched the video, they've looked up reviews, they've done their homework on us. So I want to know why are they agreeing to meet with me? So that's the very first thing. The reason I ask somebody, all right, just to gain some clarity, can you help me understand why did you agree to meet with me today? Why did, and if it's outbound, why did you agree to meet with us? If it's inbound, hey, what, what prompted you to work with us? What prompted you to reach out? And I just leave it. And it's the old school, right? The old school sales methodology of the retail is like, hey, how can I help you? What did you come in for today? All right. That, that whole premise of like what someone came in for, that's valuable. It's just the method of which we deliver it. It's the tonality. It's the fluctuations in the voice. And I have found that if we jump on a discovery call, rapport building is something that is often taught, right? Build rapport, build rapport, build rapport. Well, building rapport is a value add. Building rapport inauthentically or building rapport because you're nervous is, is a value deficit. 
You yeah. were literally demonstrating. I'm not comfortable enough to have this conversation with you. So to me, if rapport is something that has to be forced, you're doing it incorrectly. If rapport is taking up majority of the discovery call, you're doing it incorrectly. So, and I have found that if you go through a line of questions, then rapport naturally comes out because as earlier as I said, my job there in a discovery process is to demonstrate that I understand the problem that you have. And the better I can articulate the problem you have, the higher you trust that I can provide you with a solution. So what is it that prompted you to reach out to me today? Whatever the answer is, great. Can you tell me more about it? How is this impacting X, Y, Z? Just with those two questions alone, what prompted you to reach out to me or what prompted you to accept this meeting, whatever they tell you, can you tell me more about it? How is it impacting X, Y, Z, business, life, et cetera? Those two questions alone could take 20, 30 minutes. And the information that your prospect is telling you is the exact reason they're going to say yes to you later in the sales process. I have found and I've cringed when I've seen sales calls. I, I, I've cringed at video sales calls. I cringed uh, 10 years ago when I, when I saw when I was in corporate and I saw an executive VP sit with a really large, one of the largest customers we had a potential and do a discovery call that was agenda-based. Yeah. Agenda-based discovery calls. I'm going to set the agenda before the discovery call. I agree. There's some value. Definitely. Hey, man, you know, I got us clocked in for 20 or 30 minutes. Does that still work for you? Sure. I agree with that. But if the agenda dictates the flow of the conversation, and you're more focused on answering the questions that are on your agenda sheet than listening and acknowledging to what the person is telling you, you are not going to move forward in the sales process because it's the equivalent to going on a date with somebody. How was your day? How was dinner? They start responding and you look at your phone. Yep. That's the equivalent when we have these agenda-based discovery calls. But if you can just simply change the tonality, Hey, what prompted you to accept this meeting? Hey, what made you want to reach out to us today? Whatever they tell you, we go from there. The way I teach it, I said, there's a series of questions we follow that I have. And, I'm, and the very first rule I say is, these are the seven questions you want to ask. Very first rule. If you don't ask all seven questions, it's not the end of the world. And don't force yourself to ask all seven questions. We just simply say, let's gain some understanding, gain some background, gain why it's impacting this person. And if that is done effectively, I don't even have to pitch anymore. I just simply say, okay, great. So what you're telling me, I, lo I, love, I love reframing in the discovery process. So what you're telling me, Doug, is what you're sharing with me is you've tried to outsource your sales team. You've hit some, some, some snafus. Your client acquisition costs have gone up. Your payroll has gone up. Thus, profit has gone down. And now you're kind of stressing because your cash isn't where it used to be. And you're stressing over the next two or three quarters. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Here's my favorite part. Anytime I hear the problem, any problem, Doug, so what's your plan to solve this? You might think that's a silly question because obviously they've reached out to us for something. But when someone says, hey, what's your plan to solve this? It tells me where they're thinking. I don't know my plan. I came to meet you. Okay, well, who else are you meeting with? Or you know what, I, I found another outsourced sales team. Or, you know what, we're going to cut back on marketing. Well, whatever it is, I just want to hear what this person has to say. And that line of questioning just creates a conversation that we can continuously dive deeper and deeper in. We are speaking with Mr. Anthony Garcia, anthonypgarcia.com from Catapulting Commissions. Man, I love this conversation. I wrote down a bunch of stuff here. First, I wrote down, you know, you know how you... The, the old circle with the line through it, like, you know, uh, no fake yeah. rapport, right? That was my first one, no fake rapport. Uh, you know, no pitch when, you know, when not necessary, right? Those type of things. Really what I'm hearing you saying through the questioning is we're validating these people and all human beings want to be validated. I mean, I remember uh, listening to Oprah Winfrey and she said after every single conversation or interview she did, and she did, I don't know how many, tens of thousands of them on her show, the guests, no matter who they were, 
would come off and say, how did I do? How did I do? I mean, it could be the president of the United States walking off the stage and over, how did I do, right? And, and that part is the human being, being a human being, wanting to be validated. So, you know, the questions that you're asking them and understanding and giving them active feedback as you're doing, Anthony, it is validating them as a, as a human being. It's also, if you're asking the questions on the right level, you understand, like you were saying, like what a CEO thinks or a business owner thinks, you're actually creating peer-to-peer -peer bonding on the process as well. And that will increase rapport in itself. So like you said, you don't have to spend a lot of time in rapport. Uh, I was just listening to a call of a client of mine, uh, their sales team, and they were doing the exact thing that you said not to do. They, they were stuck on an agenda based. It took them 19 minutes to ask the first best question. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, right? So I went back and helped this rep reframe things. And we had two conversations. They reframed this. They literally sent me a message yesterday. So it was the day before yesterday we got done. They sent me a message yesterday. Hey, I closed twice as many sales as I've ever closed. And I did it in a, in a shorter period of time. So folks, the reason I'm bringing this up is what Anthony's bringing forth is the real deal, right? We want to build rapport through questioning. We don't need a, a script. And the reason we don't need a script is because the person we're talking with doesn't know we have a script and they don't know they're part of the script. So what you're asking, Anthony, is like questions to get them to open up and talk and to express what they're feeling, but they're, it's done in a way that's very non-threatening and it's validating them. It's it's brilliant. Um, so once we get to that place where, you know, all right, what's your plan to solve that? And they start giving you that information. I'm hearing you know where to lead the conversation at that point. Is that? Absolutely. They have just shared with you what's important to them. And then here's the kicker, right? Most um, newer sales professionals are i would even say ceos that aren't comfortable in that sales process because we've all met ceos that are really good at one thing don't really like that sales process and um so i i, I want to get clear so after they tell me everything their plan is is what is here's my plan to solve this issue here's what we were thinking right i reiterate the concern of them hey can you share with me and really subtle hey can you share with me what factors are important in determining how you're going to go about getting to this solution that's it. Whatever their solution was that they thought they were going to solve, what factors are important to you? And I love this process when we're working in enterprise sales, these long sales cycles where maybe I have to get an endorsement from entry level, mid level, and keep working my way up to a final decision maker because this is where it all comes out. Oh, well, you know what? We're meeting with four vendors. You're one of the four vendors. Got to be honest with you, we're looking for fit, we're looking for pricing, and we're going to send the structure up, and my CFO or my CEO is going to make a decision on who to meet with next. That just came out. If I'm working with a small base business, and can you share with me what factors are important for you in, in or what factors are important for you going about selecting your solution? Ah, with all honesty, I want someone to work really well with my existing CRM. I don't want to change stuff on the back end, right? Whatever it is, they're telling me additional things that are important to them. I have yet to tell them I have an answer. I have yet to tell them I have a solution. But the more I demonstrate I care about the problem, the more they trust that I have something to say. And here's how we transition. And, and this, this transition, I'm gonna share this with you. There's only one answer in this transition or one response to this transition that throws people off. And as long as you know how to address it, it doesn't matter. And here, here's my transition phrase. Done the whole thing, pause. I've reiterated the concern, right? I stated back to them what their what's what's what their concern is. I restated to them their their ideal solution. I restated to them what they told me was important. And I say because here's the deal: they know when someone sits down with you, they know you have something to sell them, right? We're not just sitting down just to sit down. They kind of know you have something to say. And I let people know right out the gate. And this is only if it's true. And it, it, you know, for the most part, it's, it's usually true through our, our, you know, we have some systems in place to make sure we don't get on discovery calls with someone who's not qualified. But I say this, and I lower the tone of the voice, you know, Doug, clearly, I would like to work with you to help solve this issue. Where do you recommend I start first? That's it. 
And the reason I say that, where do you recommend I start with first? They are going to tell me what's the important deciding factor to them. And if somebody turns around and says, well, tell me the price of your services, because that's the one question that people are like, oh, someone tells tell me the price of your services. Hey, I'd love to share with you the price of the services, but I'm not quite sure that I'm the right fit. So before we go there, why don't you tell me exactly what it is you're looking for? Where do you recommend I start with first? And I re-go back to saying, tell me where should I start first? And whatever they want to start with first, structure, pricing, integration, uh, implementation, timeline, whatever it may be, it's irrelevant because now, or it's irrelevant to me as a salesperson because I'm not going to follow the agenda. I'm going to answer what's important to them. Hey, you know, the, why don't you start with the implementation process first? Because we run a really busy system and I don't know if we can afford the downtime for our CRM or our software or whatever. Great, let's talk about it. And I jump right in and I start addressing that issue. And then we transition on to the pitch, which is a completely different discuss, completely uh, different discussion, completely different conversation. But if I'm a two-step sales process, meaning I have to conduct a demonstration, like I want to put something together and demonstrate it, everything they just told me, great. I'm going to address that. I'm going to get that put up. And then I schedule my next meeting to show whatever service demonstration that I have to do if, if I need, if I'm a two call close process. So I want to know where they want me to start. It, it gives the illusion of control back to the person that I'm meeting with. And everybody loves to be in control. And I love what you just said, which is don't pitch until your time to pitch. Oh my gosh, that is such a thing that I see people do right out of the gate. It's like, well, tell me what you got, kid. You know, they, they, they'll mm -hmm. do that out of the line. The, the, the person we're potentially selling to, if you will. Well, you know, hey, I'm busy. Tell me what you got. Okay, boom. And they pull out the pitch deck and boom, boom, boom. And they go, yeah, okay, thanks for coming in. See you later. And then right, it's like, it's because you haven't discovered, not you, but one hasn't discovered mm -hmm. what the issues are that they're trying to solve. And that is a huge rookie error that people present or pitch long before. In fact, we're not even supposed to present or pitch until we actually understand that we should be. Absolutely. And, and that's where a lot of people are running into selling, especially with a business owner or CEO. Because if we don't understand what, you know, he, she, or they are looking for, then what we're doing is we're throwing out a solution that may be missing the mark. You alluded to that early on in our conversation. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we do that, it's like, uh, uh, no, I wanted chocolate ice cream. You're throwing me yogurt. I don't eat like yogurt. Uh, we're not even going to talk about that. Have a good day. And the game is over at that point for most uh, people. Um, yeah, you, you shoot yourself before you even get off the ground. Right, right. And, you, and, and we all know, Sometimes it takes a long time to get in front of the right person. If we're doing a, a, a more complex sale, especially, it takes time to get in front of these people. And, you know, so we wasted all that time, energy, money, you know, and certainly if we're working for companies, they don't like to hear that, hey, uh, we're below quota this month. And if we're working for ourselves, we certainly don't want to hear, hey, we're below quota this month and we can't, you know, pay our bills or do this or whatever. We want to be, you know, 50, 100, 200 percent you know, above our projected numbers every single month, shortening up that discovery process to speed up that sales process is one of the, you know, ways of doing so. So it's so important. I appreciate you sharing this, Anthony. Um, people want to get a hold of you. They want to learn more about you. What, uh, what should they do? Yeah, 100%. So the website, anthonypgarcia.com has the links to everything. It's Fairly simple, anthonypgarcia.com. We talked a lot about discovery. If you go to discoveryscript.com, there's there's a, a template. I don't want to call it a script that you can download. It really kind of outlines the process we just discussed. Um, but both of those will get you connected to me directly. That is a, and folks, I recommend you do go get the template. You know, And if, if he didn't catch it, I just reframed what Anthony just said. You know, As I asked, he said, where do you recommend that I start first? I asked the same question, but just reframed it a little bit. So... Um, brother, thanks for being on. I really appreciate you bringing your A-game here. Uh, yeah, we'll put everything in the show notes. Okay. Uh, any final closing words on your end? You know, here's the, here's the big thing, Doug. This area of business we're in right now, so, so much noise, so much distractions that can either accelerate you 
or decelerates you. And I, I would tell everybody, everyone of your listeners right now, everybody who's a CEO, everyone who's a, a salesperson, we are going to adapt and do very well. And those that don't adapt are going to struggle because there's a lot of changes taking place. But the one thing that can never change is the ability for human connection and human interaction. And the more robotic we sound, the less successful we'll become. The more I can empathize with you, the better success we'll experience. You want to say that again? Because I think that is the, the epitome of what we must do going forward in selling. Yeah, absolutely. Right. The more robotic we sound, the less success we're going to have. The more empathy I can display, the more success I will have. We, we are in a time where the ability to be empathetic with each other isn't glorified, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to go on the political spiel of life, but we, don't, we, we live in an era where you're either on this team or that team. Pick it. It doesn't matter. Political, religion, sports, ex- entrepreneur, corporate, et cetera. We never really demonstrate the empathy. But I have found the clients I work with who, who've retained me to help their process. And the clients that I work with who've, who've uh, you know, I help them improve their sales process, who've hired me, is just empathy. It's simply saying, hey, man, I completely understand where you're coming from. And I don't say it unless I mean it. I'm not lying. I definitely understand where you're coming from. And I want to hear how it's impacting you. So we can elevate our level of empathy. We can elevate revenue. We can elevate profits. We can elevate a lot of the things. You know, I don't know who said this, but some somebody said we're human beings having a human experience on this earth. And um, sorry, I don't know who quoted it, but the reality is I, I, I was just staying in some hotels and I won't mention, well, you know, I will mention the brand Hilton mm-hmm. <laughs> was the hotel brand that I was in. And I picked up the phone and I dialed down to dial down to the front desk and up came a message like, hi, this is, you know, whatever, uh, Pam, and I'm the automated attendant in training here, you know, da, da, da. And it's like, and I would like to route your call to the appropriate person. Please tell me what you've got going on right now. And I, in my brain, I went, you gotta be kidding me. Like we are trying to dehumanize this process to this level that I can't get a person live at a front desk at a hotel. And like, and I'm a diamond member with Hilton. So I mm-hmm. stay there a lot, but the reality is I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna check out another brand. And, 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 and in my head, I'm like, why am I thinking this way? And it goes back to what you just said. You know, human beings want to be relating to one another and have this connection that's going on. And I see a lot in selling people hiding behind, say, social selling, for example, right? And and they're trying to close deals without ever talking to somebody and, and complex deals while I'm trying to talk. And, and the crazy part that drives me nuts is every once in a while it works. And so people will celebrate it out on, you know, in the media. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, when somebody wins in, you know, I don't know, multi-level marketing, they say, oh, this person is, you know, at the top of the game. Well, they, they didn't tell you about the other 12 failures they had to get to that point, right? And so I think what you just said is the, the key to going forward in selling. If we can be different, if we can... Uh, if we can differentiate ourselves on the basis that we are human people who care about human people, that is what people who own businesses are looking for. And yes, we can automate certain parts of our process, but when it comes down to it, I think it goes back to, you know, day one, when two people met, they, they had to communicate in some level. Otherwise the rest of us wouldn't be here. Absolutely. Anthony, thanks so much for being here again, folks. Anthony P. Garcia at catapulting commissions go check it out download the template anthony thanks again doug thanks for having me on the show okay so if you have a set agenda in your discovery process and you're just following that to the t you're probably boring the heck out of the person on the other line uh, or in the other person that you're in front of and the reality is when somebody is already on step seven you do want to kind of go back and try to figure out step one through seven you got to do it in an expedited fashion because if they're already on step seven and step nine is where they close, you've got to get there quick. You just can't take time. People are less tolerant than they were in the process. Now, the more rapport you have built, the more tolerant they will be of your particular process. But if that process is just, you know, putting them to sleep, 
or just frustrating them, like, let's get to the point, then what will happen is rapport is going to get broken. You're going to start seeing a look at the watch or the clock or whatever, and like, hey, I got to get out of here. So important stuff on this particular podcast, as well as all the other podcasts we've done. But this one here on when you're supposed to exit out as a founder or how you speed up the discovery process to increase your sales process speed, so speed to close, so important. One of the mistakes I see a lot with founders is they exit too early. And as Anthony said, they're not allowing people to shadow them. They haven't trained the people appropriately. So they want to get out of that sales process, the CEO, the founder, the business, the executive, and that makes sense, right? They may not need to be there. They may need to be focusing on something else because in the beginning, you know, you start, you're doing everything. Then as you get to the next level, you want to manage, manage, you know, manage people uh, in that process, but you've got to be able to hand off that process appropriately so that they understand the process. Otherwise, they're, they're going to just be wallowing there going, what do I do? Or worse yet, sometimes making it up and causing disruptions in your in your overall process. So you want to make sure that that process is a, you know, a clean handoff, like in a relay race where they hand the baton, that it's a very clean you know, transfer from one person's hand to the other person's hand so the other person could just run with that baton. Now you can manage them. But if you hand that baton off and it's kind of fumbling around, you know, you're going to lose time, stumble, you might lose the race right, due to that. So you want that, A, and B, if you're exiting out too early, then, you know, that that person is going to struggle. If you're exiting out too late where you're the bottleneck, and I've had that happen in my life where, you know, I've actually had sales closed and then the founder goes back in and, and reopens the sale. In other words, it's closed. They're ready to sign. The owner walks in and they call me back and they go, hey, we're thinking about X, Y, Z now because we talked to the founder or the owner. And they said this, and so we have questions now, right? So it can be one or the other. So when you're going through there, you know, if you don't know how to do this, reach out to a guy like Anthony and let somebody help you uh, get to that position, right? When you're working through your transition in the discovery process, you know, to speed up that sale, again, if you don't know how to do this, reach out to Anthony, reach out to people who can help you. And that will speed up the process. One thing I would have done early on in my career that I didn't do because I didn't know they existed was I would have got mentorship a lot earlier because, you know, I had a kind of slugging it out on the streets, so to speak, right? You make mistakes doing that way. But when you deal with people who are helping you, who have already been there and are willing to share, just as, you know, we were here on this podcast, you can move ahead a lot faster. And, you know, that's the way to do it. So if you like the subject of this podcast, you know, please let us know by going up, giving it a five-star review, give it some comments. Tell your friends about this podcast. The more people that know, the better we can help other people out there. We started this podcast not to monetize this podcast, but we started this podcast to actually help people. And that's how we continue to keep doing that. We will bring real guests who will share real information, who have been there, done it, uh, so you can rely on that information. If you are looking to build yourself up to the top 1% earners category, uh, or just, you know, go from A to B, or if you're at B and you want to go to the top 1%, reach out to me at Doug at CEOSalesStrategies.com. And we're running a 1% university that is coming out this year. And if you want to get on the waiting list, please do so. If you have a subject matter you want to know more about or that you think you're an expert in that you'd be a great fit for the show, reach out to us at you matter, Y-O-U-M-A-T-T-E-R, because you do matter to us at CEOSalesStrategies.com. Once again, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast saying, go out, sell something, sell a lot of it, sell it profitably, play win-win, make your day happy, make someone else's day happy. That's what we do in sales to your success. Thank you for listening to another episode of the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. What is something that you learned that you could act on today? Don't forget to schedule it now or it may never get forward momentum. If you find our content valuable, please leave a favorable review and let us know what you liked. Please also share this with others if the content will help them. For our show notes, other episodes, and more interesting content and resources, please visit 
ceosalesstrategiespodcast.com. See you soon and to your continued success.